What's up, my lovely people of Seek? <laughs> Dude, so good to be here. You guys know that God is good all the time because you heard it growing up in church, but I have a new one for you. It goes like this. Hail Mary, full of grace, and you say, kick the devil in the face. Hail Mary, full of grace. That's so violent. I don't know what to do with that. The Bible's violent. Deal with it. Anyways. But before we begin, let's truly say that prayer together. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I truly appreciate all of you being here. You could have been taking a day nap. You could have been doing a lot of things, but you came to learn about our mother. And I don't know if you know this, but our mother Mary is absolutely incredible. Can I get an amen? <clears throat> I want to share a quick testimony. Some of you have heard a little bit about this. Um, if you were here at Seek last year, anyone here at Seek last year? That's what's up. During my keynote, I gave a little bit of that, that story, but I'm going to extend it out a little bit more. So growing up as a Catholic, just nominally, I got into my dream school of UCLA out in California. I know. I, I ended up transferring, so don't judge me, all right? But I'm living the party life. I'm, I'm just, I, I didn't care about my faith other than the fact that I went to appease my, my Catholic guilt or my conscience, whatever you want to say. But what should have been some of the most young, dumb, carefree years of my life, right, just choosing to hook up and party and, and do whatever I wanted to do, it was marked with a problem. It was out my conscience was bothering me. And so in order to appease God somehow, I decided to go back to my dorm room, and I got out my rosary starter kit. That's essentially the, the glow-in-the-dark beads with the trifold pamphlet. Because those landing prayers are a little bit sketchy for people. They're like, Hell, uh, what? This is not the Hail Mary? No, it's not. The beads glow in the dark because they have to, so that when you're stumbling through the dark to find them, you can find them. And so I got out my rosary starter kit, I knelt down next to my dorm bed, and I started praying. And what I used to perceive the rosary as, which was a medieval torture device meant to bore you straight into heaven, was actually a really interesting prayer because someone taught me that it was meditative. You know, everyone and their mama nowadays are into meditation. You spend like five minutes on social media and some influencers like, I wake up in the morning, and I open the curtains, and I let the sun energy hit me, and then I manifest all my goals for the day, and then I drive off in my Range Rover. Follow, like, and subscribe for more. <laughs> and you're like, what the heck are we meditating on right now? Um, Catholics have been meditating for 2,000 years, and we meditate on the life of Christ Jesus. And so someone taught me that as I prayed the rosary, I'm supposed to meditate, right? Now, if y'all go to the movies, obviously most people don't go to listen to the soundtrack, unless you're kind of a nerd, which, you know, I can appreciate that, <laughs> right? There you go. <laughs> I'm a big Hans Zimmer fan, so if he's, there you go. <laughs> Boom, right? Really intense sound effects. But for the most part, when we go to a movie, we're listening to the music, but the music is enhancing what's happening on the screen. Well, the prayers of the rosary are like the soundtrack. The meditation is indeed the scenes that we are seeing unfold. And so I started to use my imagination and to imagine myself there when the angel Gabriel is visiting Mary. And I did that for the rest of the Joyful Mysteries. And honestly, so much peace. I felt more peace, joy, and purpose from 15 minutes, 20 minutes of prayer than I did from a whole month of screwing around. So I came back to it the next day. I was hooked. There was something that was totally different from every other asset of my every other aspect of my life, that I kept praying the rosary. I was intrigued now. And the thing about the mother of God is she has this really simple, hidden, humble way of drawing us closer to Jesus. If you don't know this already, that's really her sole desire. John chapter 2, verse 5, do whatever he tells you. And so weird things started happening. I was praying outside of my dorm room, and as I was praying the rosary, I started smelling roses out of nowhere. It wasn't because there was a girl with rose perfume or a rose bush and I didn't do drugs. <laughs> the mother of God was paying me a visit. It was what's called a signal grace. Sometimes God will allow these things for the stubborn of heart and mind to draw them out. And so he was literally allowing me this encounter with his mother. She didn't say a word. I didn't see a vision. I smelled her fragrance and shots were fired. That's all I knew. Without saying a word, the mother of God was saying, I'm real. 
my son, Jesus is real. Continue on this path. And I'm like, I don't even have a major, okay. So I kept praying the rosary. As I kept praying the rosary, I was being led deeper. She led me back to confession. She, there was another moment, and it's crazy. I had this testimony about Our Lady of Guadalupe. You know, I'm totally Mexican. No, I'm not. I'm Korean. But yeah, she kept appearing to me under this image and this title. And so I went to confession at a, a local parish there in West, West L.A., and I'm getting ready for confession. I remember praying in front of the image of Our Lady Guadalupe. And I'm just like, Mother, help me to make a good confession. And so I sat down in the, the pew for my turn for the confessional. And I started smelling roses again. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, no rose bush magic. No, I'm kidding. So it kept happening. But when I opened up the confessional door, it was like, Vroom! and I was like, wow, still no roses. I got my confession heard. I asked Father afterwards, hey, Father, do you smell the roses? He's like, I just smell my ham sandwich from lunch. <laughs> Once again, the mother of God very mysteriously was leading me closer. I had this wildly turbulent but amazing conversion in college. And it, it led me to such a point in my life where I was like, I, I don't want the parting. Screw it. I, I, I don't just want to pursue pleasure. That's not the purpose of my life. I want to pursue Christ. And so much so that, no offense, ladies, I'm like, I don't even want to date. I just want Jesus. <laughs> Girls are drama. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I transferred colleges to Franciscan University of Steubenville out in Ohio. That's right. Catholic Disneyland. So I went out there, and lo and behold, our Lady of Guadalupe in every one of the dorm chapels. And I'm like, dude, she's everywhere. I love this. You know, I wanted to take my discernment a step further. And so as I graduated Steubenville, I actually discerned with the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal in New York City for a few years. In a past life, you may have seen me, uh, this Asian dude, gray robes. You know, you've seen some of them walking around shaved head. And you may have thought, is that a Buddhist? No, that's a rosary, it's a cross. But at any rate, I digress. The patroness of the CFRs is who? Our Lady of Guadalupe. Bro, I lived in a friary in the Bronx, New York, that had a 30-foot mural of Our Lady of Guadalupe on the side of the wall. Okay? If she wasn't trying to tell me something, I mean, I'm pretty thick-headed here, but she was following me everywhere I went. And ultimately, Religious life wasn't for me. I had to go through the discernment process. I highly recommend discerning if that's something that God is putting on your heart, but that's another talk for another time. But as I left the community, and sometimes you talk to guys and even gals who leave religious life, or maybe they left the seminary, and it's not a bad thing, honestly. It's, it's always a win-win in my mind because those years of formation, I mean, they were really powerful for me. I feel like they, they set me up for success and, and the ministry that I'm a part of now. But at the time, honestly, it was, it was hard because people are like, well, why'd you come home? Like, were you weird, too weird for it? Like, did you do something wrong? It's like, no, I did everything right. I gave it my best shot. But to be quite honest, I was in a bit of a spiritual funk because I was like, I had to figure out who I was now because my identity was so wrapped around this idea of being a brother or a priest. And honestly, it was hard. But I eventually met my beautiful wife. I met her um, at a friend's wedding reception. I told a lot of the guys who are here today, you know, I was hosting, I was cracking my corny jokes, saw this pretty girl laughing at him. I'm like, <sighs> pretty girl laughing at jokes. <laughs> I must talk to her after. So I shoot the shot, got a number, took her on a date. It was epic. And then a year later, I asked her to marry me. And she said, yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Man, that desert, that desert of singleness. Woo. No, I'm kidding. That was a struggle. I get it. I get it. That's a whole other talk for another day. Okay. But we got married, and we, we got pregnant with our first baby about seven or eight months into marriage. And the thing about pregnancy is there's no real, like, exact date that you can be 100% sure the baby's going to arrive, but the doctor will give you an estimate. And so 
you know, we went to our first doctor's visit. We did like an ultrasound. And the doctor's like, oh, well, the baby's estimated to come on December 12th. And I'm like, yeah, she is. <laughs> December 12th is the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, if you didn't know already. <laughs> and so I'm like, heck, yes, yeah, she's coming on December 12th. You see how Mexican I am? And he's like, no. I'm like, ¿qué es tu problema? <laughs> Coreano Guadalupano. And so at any rate, the baby is growing inside of her tummy. We're just praying. We're getting ready. But about nine days out from December 12th, so that would be about December 3rd, back in 20, gosh, what year was that? 2014. We started Novena. A novena, nine days of prayer to Our Lady Guadalupe. And I'm like, Mother Mary, I'd be honored if indeed the baby would come on that day. I'd dedicate this baby to you. She's yours. I don't know. You could do whatever you want with her. She could be a nun. Uh, it don't matter to me. No, it does matter, obviously. But, but I was totally comfortable with that idea because I entrusted myself to Our Lady. And you know, I had tr turned out okay. okay. No, I'm just kidding. I turned out okay. I'm fine. But seriously, December... 11th came around, and my wife's like, honey, I don't think the baby is coming tomorrow. I'm like, you have little faith. <laughs> Let's get down on those knees and pray right now together. So literally the evening of December 11th, she's like, the contractions are here, but I don't think this is it. And I'm like, babe, don't you worry. And so I took her to Costco. I made that girl walk. But don't worry, I took her to the movies too. I let her sit, okay? Calm down, calm down. I'm a good husband, I'm a good husband. And brothers and sisters, we, we, we went home for the night. She retired, she, she laid in bed, and for some reason I was a little bit anxious, so I just stayed up till like, I mean, literally the crack of dawn. I don't know why I was up till like two or three. I think I know why now. And all of a sudden she goes, babe, my water broke. And I'm like, it is time. <laughs> So I drove that girl to the hospital. We went to St. Joseph's Hospital in Orange, California. And she was in labor for, for many hours, but praise be to God, my firstborn daughter, Audrey, was born on December 12th. Coreano <laughs> Guadalupano! Brothers and sisters, my... Um, my mother and your mother is so beautiful, so wonderful. Um, I, I tr Let me show you my family, by the way. Can we throw up that slide of my family really quick? That's my beautiful wife of 10 years. Audrey is the, the girl on the bottom right. Audrey, her baptismal name is Guadalupe, of course. We have five beautiful kids, and we happen to have one on the way. Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. We take bare fruit and multiply very seriously in our household, okay? God is good. No, I, we, we have something so beautiful, and I'm truly honored to be her husband and, and the father of these babies. But Mother Mary, she's so wonderful, and last, not this past December, but the December prior to that, I got to lead a pilgrimage, indeed, to Our Lady of Guadalupe on the feast day. There were an estimated 11 million Catholics who showed up over the course of a week. It's insane. But I got to behold the actual tilma, the miraculous tilma that St. Juan Diego had literally received as a sign to not only the bishop at the time, but the entire world. This tilma effectively converted an estimated 9 million ancient Mexican Aztecs. Okay, And this was literally shortly thereafter the, the moment in Germany where the Protestant Reformation had started. And the Catholic Church had lost that many Catholics. Mother Mary shows up and she's like, watch, watch me, watch me. <laughs> I'm going to lead them back to my son. Here we go. Let's go. And that's what she does. She always leads us back to Christ. Let there be no confusion whatsoever. She has never failed to do that for me. She has never taken the, the praises for herself. No, she has always pointed back to God. And for that reason and many others, I am a mama's boy for life. And I will sing her praises for life. St. Maximilian Kolbe, the great saint of Auschwitz, said, Never be afraid of loving the Blessed Virgin too much. You can never love her more than Jesus did. Oh, Kurt? I mean, th 
Think about how much God flexed on his mom. Consider, I mean, we're talking the immaculate conception, literally freed her from original sin, allowed her to be his mom, the mother of God, assumed her body and soul into heaven, crowned her as queen of heaven and earth. And it's like, you think you're going to love her more than Jesus loved her? You can't. Even if you tried. You could pray a rosary like 24-7, and you, you couldn't. You couldn't outsing the praises that God gave to her himself. You can't. And honestly, that might make people feel a little bit weird, but let me just normalize it completely. Let's say you go to a, a museum, and you see a beautiful sculpture. And when you see the sculpture, unbeknownst to you, the artist is hiding right behind the sculpture. It's almost like a prank. And this artist is just hearing people sing the praises of this, this work. Oh my gosh, I've never seen something so exquisite in my life. Now, as the artist back there going, so triggered, these... These totally ungrateful people not acknowledging me at all. No. Whenever you praise the work, you praise whom? The artist, the creator. And this is how it is with God. Any praise that Mary receives, guess what? Jesus Christ receives the praise. And to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Mary, Mary reaffirmed it herself. She says, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And this was from the Magnificat in the Gospel of Luke. Getting so emotional about this. Um, now, brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but I think social media is probably the best place in the world for people to have meaningful and helpful debates. I think it will lead to... <laughs> Absolute world peace. Psych! Uh, just kidding. For some reason, a lot of non-Catholics follow me on Instagram. And, and I have a lot of non-Catholic friends. Praise God. I'm not here to, like, badmouth them. There's a lot of good friends of mine who love the Lord. But I, I'm talking particularly about the people who I meet online. Man, they are feisty. And, and they know I'm Catholic. So it's like every time I post anything remotely Catholic, man, they come up like, uh, they come out of the woodworks to just start chopping, chopping at the Catholic Church. So anyways, you know, a couple of the, the fiery comments. You are an idolatrous, hellbound, Bible, ignorant, Mary worshiper who thinks he can earn heaven based solely on works. Thank you. <laughs> no! Where did you learn this nonsense? Archbishop Fulton Sheen said it best. There are not 100 people in the United States who hate the Catholic Church, but there are millions who hate what they wrongly perceive the Catholic Church to be. I tell people all the time, online, offline, it's like, if, if I believed what you think I believe, I would hate me too. Because this ain't it. Like, you, you've been told a lie, and so it's a false presumption as to why you're even arguing me in the first place. So, for the sake of both your edification and entertainment, I am going to share some of the most common arguments about Mary that I receive online, and I will attempt all of this while using a variety of my favorite accents. Thank you. <coughs> I am from Texas, so I have to represent. Y'all Catholics worship Mary! We don't worship her, sir. No, the word dulia describes the veneration given to a saint for his or her example in following Christ. But the word hyperdulia in Latin describes a special veneration we give to the mother of God alone. Yes, in Latin, the word latria describes worship given to God alone. So for the umpteenth millionth time, we don't worship Mary. We honor and venerate her. Thank you. So you worship her, right? No. <laughs> Next. But she was just an ordinary woman. Basically basic, but loved by God, like we all are. We're all equal. There's no difference. <laughs> Just an ordinary woman of God, you say? You realize she gave birth to the Son of God. Have you given birth to the Son of God? <laughs> What's strange to me is that you offer more respect to your mom. And as much as she's a lovely lady, and no offense, but Mary gave birth to someone infinitely greater than you. <laughs> it's not even a burn, it's just perfect truth. I'm not lying. Next. <clears throat> she couldn't have given birth to God. She was just a human. So don't call her mother of God. 
But you're subscribing to an ancient heresy called Nestorianism, you see. Jesus is true God and true man, 100% God and 100% human. You can't separate his two natures. Therefore, if Mary gave birth to his humanity, she gave birth to God. Thank you for trying. <laughs> Next. Hey, you shouldn't ask Mary to pray for you. You should go straight to Jesus since he intercedes for us at the Father's right hand. Amen. Jesus does intercede for us before the Father as our Lord and Savior. But throughout the New Testament, we are told to pray for one another, come in agreement in prayer. Have you ever gone to somebody in your church and asked them to pray for you? Oh, sure I have, laddie. Now, why did you do that? Why didn't you go straight to God? Oh, because they have a good relationship. That's right. James chapter 5, verse 16 emphasizes the point that the righteous have prayers that are powerful and effective. That's why you go and ask. Well, what's your point? Well, probably because uh, Mary's prayers are pretty effective. Uh, John chapter 2, the miracle of Cana. Christ hadn't started his public ministry yet. And Mary's like, son, they're out of wine. He wasn't a wine distributor. And what does he do? He, he listens. He's a good Jewish boy. He answers the prayer. He begins his public ministry at the behest of Mama. Next. Well, in praying to Mary and saying, Hail Marys, you are committing idolatry. She also is dead, so you can't, she can't even hear your prayers. Actually, when we pray the Hail Mary, we pray scripture. Hail full of grace comes from Luke 128. From Luke 142, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And remember, she's not the one ultimately answering our prayers. She's just praying with us and for us to God. And that piece about her being dead, well, Mark chapter 12, verse 27 says, He is not God of the dead, but of the living. Hebrews 12, 1 says, We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Revelation chapter 8 verse 4 says that before the throne of God in heaven, the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up in the presence of God from the angel's hand. So what are they praying about? What do you think they're praying about? I mean, it's crazy because like if you died and went to heaven, would you just be like, family and friends, peace out, good luck, suckers. <laughs> no. Your, your charity, your love, your concern for, for fellow brothers and sisters in Christ would be even enhanced. You would want to pray and intercede for them, whether or not you're in heaven. I mean, let's face it. That's what they're doing. That's what I would do. And that's certainly what the mother of God is doing and what she would do. Next, well, you Catholics are idolaters because you have paintings of her which you blow kisses to. Oh, wow, I've, I've never heard that one. Well, uh, if you have a picture of your mom on the wall, then I guess you're an idolater just like me. <laughs> you see, the point is, like, we're not worshiping the statue or the painting. It, because, once again, even if it was a statue of Christ, we wouldn't worship it. No, that, that statue merely symbolizes the person whose, whose image, if you will, is being represented in that art piece. And so, too, with Mary, when we see a picture or a statue of her, we're not pretending that that's her, but rather we're being reminded of the fact that she is present in our lives. Okay, so we don't worship her, by the way, for the umpteenth millionth time. Well, Mary isn't holier than the rest of us. Okay, well, let's talk about that too. In the Old Testament, the Ark of the Old Covenant was something that was basically instructed by God to be created. And what was the Ark of the Old Covenant? It essentially was a vessel made of incorruptible wood, plated with pure gold. Uh, it was so holy that if you touched it, you die. In fact, this guy in the Old Testament by the name of Uzziah, even after being told not to touch it, thought it would be a fantastic idea. Instead of carrying it on poles like God told us to, he wanted to put it on a cart. And the cart was tipping the thing over, and he's like, no, and he touched it, and he died. That's a terrible way to go in the Old Testament, guys. Okay, but why was the ark so holy? It held three symbols, symbols that represented God. It was the manna that rained down from heaven. It was the two stone tablets that was given to Moses, the commandments. And it was the priestly rod, the staff of Aaron. Okay, these were symbols of God and it was that holy. Who or what is the ark of the new covenant? Well, in Revelation chapter 12, John 
he sees a vision. Actually, right there in 11, he says that he sees the ark of the Lord. And then chapter 12, he says he sees an image, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars. And this, while this represents the people of Israel, it also represents the mother of God. And now how holy would she have to be to hold not just symbols of God, but to hold the literal thing that these symbols were pointing to, the manna that fell from heaven. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. The two stone tablets, the commandments that represented the law and the prophets. Jesus says, I am the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. The staff of Aaron. Jesus Christ is the universal high priest who redeems all mankind back to the Father. So he's the real thing. And dang, she's the real thing. How holy would the mother of God have to be? Well, nothing that you just said was biblical. <laughs> yes, it was. It's crazy because as this conversation continues, and really no good conversations happen online. I think you guys already know this. Oftentimes they happen in person. I think people are much more reasonable when you, you share these things. But having the ability to defend and explain the faith and articulate it is really important. Even if you don't know the answers, that's totally fine. But say, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to come back, and I'll give you the answer. Don't make stuff up on the fly. If you don't know what the heck you're talking about, please. <laughs> and that's okay. We all don't know. We're, we're not all Dr. Shree, okay? It's like, he's my older Asian brother in Christ, okay? <laughs> and uh, I'm giving you the intro course. He's going to give you the main course. But I'm happy with that. That's okay. But so, too, we're all called to give, indeed, a witness for why we believe what we believe. And brothers and sisters, ironically, no good deed is ever left unpunished. So most people are like, LOL, you're still an idolater. And I'm like, God bless you. St. Bernadette of Lourdes, who was a visionary who saw the Blessed Mother in Lourdes, France, her quote was this, because people were skeptical of what was happening in her life. Her, her visions and her experiences are now vindicated and blessed by the church. But she said this, it is not my job to convince, only to inform. Let me say that again. It is not my job to convince, it's only my job to inform. Brothers and sisters, every one of us has free will, and we got to respect that, but also let ourselves off the hook a little bit, because we're not the ones who save anybody, amen? It's true. I used to put a lot of pressure on myself, especially in college, where I'm like, I come to know Jesus, I love my Catholic faith, and now I'm concerned that all of my peers are going to a bad place. And I literally thought it was on me to, like, save them, which was my hubris in action, right? But the thing is, God is so merciful and good that he has so many servants out there, and we're just one little piece of the pie, and that's okay. But definitely pray, study your faith, and share. In order to truly appreciate Mary... In our Catholic faith, we need to dive into Scripture, but because there's so little said about her, at least explicitly in the New Testament, which is why so many non-Catholics and Catholics get so hung up on, like, why she's even relevant or important, we need to dive into what's called biblical typologies. If you don't know what a typology is, essentially, it's an example in the Old Testament that's, that sheds light on an example in the New Testament and vice versa. Let me give you an example. In Genesis, the old Adam, right, is the Adam who, who, who mucked it up. He screwed up. He and Eve, they, they're a real combo, and they, they messed it up for all of us. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. But then St. Paul talks about the new Adam, right? And who is the new Adam? The new Adam is Christ. And so you see, that is a typology. But let's keep working on that, that example. There's also an old Eve, Old Eve was greeted by the serpent, the ancient serpent, namely Satan, whereas the new Eve, Mary, was greeted by the angel. The old Eve disobeyed God and rebelled against his plan, while, whereas the new Eve obeyed God and said yes to his plan of salvation. Old Eve opened the floodgates to sin, suffering, and death by her decision, and the new Eve opened her heart and her womb to the Savior who would redeem all of mankind. Are you not entertained? I mean, this is, this is profound stuff. Like the typologies are revealing to us what is going on. Why is she important? Let's continue. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. 
there's a little Easter egg in that, in that verse that's really important. Because when it seems like all is lost and Adam and Eve have indeed committed the sin, which is, is terrible. I mean, literally, we're only a couple chapters into the Bible, and, and, and they screw up royally. God in his mercy is already prophesying the good news. So this verse, Genesis 3.15, is also known as the proto-evangelium, the pre-good news. What does that verse say? When God is speaking punishment to both the woman and to the serpent, he says to Satan, because you have done this, you will crawl on your belly, eat dirt, blah, blah, blah. But I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. You will strike at his heel and he will crush your head. But what's odd about that is if he was still talking about Eve, she had a lot to do with Satan. To have enmity between someone or two people, that's complete division. You have nothing to do with the other person. So he's not talking about Eve. He's talking about another woman. All right? This is a really important note to, to carry with you for a second. Let's fast forward to the, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, the Annunciation. Depending on what Bible translation you're reading, sometimes that, like, that, that greeting of angel Gabriel to Mary, it, it doesn't have the desired effect. Hail, highly favored one. Oh, come on. Hail, full of grace. We're getting closer. But let's, let's keep going. In the original Greek text, the angel Gabriel greets Mary with this crazy Greek word, and it, it, it's kikeritomini. Kikeritomini. I'm not going to spell that for you. I'd probably spell it wrong. Kikari Tomini, what does that translate to in English? You who have been perfected in grace. You who have been perfected in grace. That sounds a lot different than hail highly favored one. Essentially, the angel is dropping some news that even before this chance meeting, God had prepared her in a profound way for this exact moment. For her yes. Okay? And I want to tie this in also to little Catholic trivia. You, you guys know what a dunce cap is? It's like that traditional hat where back, I guess back like in our parents' day and age or our grandparents, if you got in trouble in class, they sit you on a stool, put a pointy hat on your head. It's called the dunce cap, right? You know where that comes from? It is named after a, a saint in the church. His name is Blessed John Dunce Scotus. And the reason his enemies this became a thing is because his theological enemies hated his guts, so they would just call him names. And they basically made his name a bad word. And they're like, don't be such a dunce. And so literally, they're throwing shade on one of our church's saints, Blessed John Duns Scotus. But why was Blessed John Duns Scotus, why is he relevant to this conversation? Because when the dogma of the Immaculate Conception dropped, basically in the 19th, I think it was the 19th century in our Catholic church history, his theology was, was critical in basically helping the church understand how do we best explain this revealed truth that God is telling us now. Now, people will say, well, if Mary's sinless, how can she be saved by Christ, right? Valid question. Is she not a sinner? If she's not a sinner, then she doesn't need a savior. But she herself says, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my savior, right? And so here's the thing. Um, if you use this analogy, Adam and Eve, they fell into, let's just say, uh, using an analogy, they fall into quicksand. They fall into original sin, and everyone in humanity is on this one track way of falling into sin. But Christ redeems us, pulls us out of the quicksand. Let's just use that example, okay? Eve is on this same track because she's a human being. What if a person says to her, hey, you're going to fall in the quicksand. Go this way around it. Is she still being saved? Yes, but she's being saved more excellently. And so God found it very fitting to prepare Mary in such a way that she would receive in anticipation for what he was going to do on the cross well after he, he was even conceived in her womb. She would give her the graces so that the angel Gabriel could affirm this and say, you who have been perfected in grace. Brothers and sisters, you know, the tease about the time that they've given me for this talk is... I, I have like an hour more to share with you in terms of typologies. I just want to get your appetite wet in terms of, of Mary and Scripture. Go and study your faith. Go and study the why behind the what. Um, I could say so much more, and, and there's so many beautiful things, but I want to start wrapping it up by sharing some quotes from saints. 
St. Maximilian Kolbe said, if anyone does not wish to have Mary Immaculate for his mother, he will not have Christ for his brother. It's true. St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, the legendary nun, she said, no Mary, no Jesus, no mother, no son. It's really that simple. It was her yes that was so incredibly important. John Paul II, one of my great heroes in life, great heroes in the church, he is amazing. He devoted and entrusted his entire papacy to Our Lady. Every pope has a papal motto. His was totus tuus, which comes from the Latin totally yours. And that was coined by a French saint by the name of Saint Louis de Montfort, who basically wrote this amazing book. By, it was called True Devotion to Mary. If you want a great read to learn more about the Blessed Mother, and why we should be devoted to her, that is a classic. But one of the, some of the things that St. Louis de Montfort said include, the Virgin Mary is the surest, easiest, quickest, and most perfect means of reaching Jesus Christ. Mary is a holy place, the holy of holies in which saints are formed and shaped. And the more a soul is consecrated to Mary, the more it will be consecrated to Jesus Christ. Really, the simple understanding of what Marian consecration is all about, it's this understanding that just as Jesus came through Mary to come to us, it is fitting that we also go through Mary to come to Jesus. Now, she does not replace Jesus in any which way. She is not the Savior. She is not the Redeemer of mankind by no means. But think about it this way. If God the Father entrusted his only begotten, his most precious son Jesus, to this woman, for nine months, she carried this, this divine child in her womb. And when he was born, she had the noble task of raising him. If the mother of God was given this task, what fear in the world do we have to say, Mother Mary, be a mother to me? We have no excuses. I mean, if it was good enough for God, she's good enough for us. And once again, her desire is only to bring us closer to God. And St. Louis de Montfort uses, uses the example that she literally, Jesus is gestating in her womb for nine months, and he is born. And so in a spiritual sense, Mary wants to help form the image of God in us so that we can truly, right, be born again in Christ. It, it is wild, and this might sound so new to some of you, but be certain that you can't find one saint in the history of the church, right? I mean, New Testament and beyond, who didn't love the Blessed Mother, who wasn't devoted to the Blessed Mother. I don't know if this is going to, like, make your, like, head turn around, but, like, Martin Luther, who was an Augustinian priest, who is unfortunately the founder of the Reformation, which splintered Christianity, even he is quoted saying that, we all have an inherent desire to venerate the mother of God in our hearts. Okay? So, like, it's this crazy division that's happened that's not really anyone's responsibility or fault at this point. But nonetheless, God wants to lead us back to our mother. And I, how do I dare say that? Our Lady of Fatima, who appeared to three children in Portugal, she shared really important messages from God. And among them were God's desire to establish devotion to her immaculate heart, especially through the prayer of the rosary. She accurately predicted the future Second World War. She showed the children a vision of hell and told them many souls are condemned there because there's no one to pray and make sacrifices for them. But I want to share some quotes as I wrap this up. She said to these children, and she, she says to us, Jesus wants to use you to make me known and loved. He wants to establish devotion to my immaculate heart in the world. To those who accept it, I promise salvation, and those souls will be loved by God as flowers I have placed to embellish his throne. What does it mean she's promising salvation? She's not the Savior. So what does she mean, promise salvation? She's saying the prayer that we pray at the end of the rosary, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Through her prayers and her intercession, she wants to prepare us and dispose us well to receive the promises of her son. This is what she does. This is who she is. Our lady loves you, and she wants to lead you to Christ and help you to become the son and daughter and the saint that you are called to be. I hope and pray that my talk, while it's a measly 30, 35, 40-minute talk, 
I, I've just scratched the surface, even if that. I pray that you will leave here with a new desire to grow closer to Our Lady. And be assured, if you grow close to her, you will undoubtedly grow close to Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Much love for all of you. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your time. And see you.